The problem with patents is secrecy. I don't mean this as a legal matter. I mean just when you're assembling a panel. It's really, really hard uh, to get people to talk about patents, whether it's the middle of a war or not. And uh, the people who accepted our invitation to be here today are an extraordinary collection of people because they will talk about patents. Um, to have a client talk about patents is a uh, dangerous thing. And I'm very grateful to Stefano Zaccaroli for agreeing to fly over here and talk about patents. Uh, and I kept him standing next to me as one does when one's clients are talking about patents so I can push a sock in it the moment that <laughs> something gets said that isn't supposed to be said. The other panelists don't need this treatment, but my clients I have to keep close. Um, Justin Colonino has uh, worked uh, at the Software Freedom Law Center uh, from the time he was a second year student uh, at law school. Uh, and I lost uh, the ability to hold on to him the minute everybody else in the world figured out how brilliant he was. Uh, and law firms and federal judges and other people have been uh, delaying indefinitely Justin's return to SFLC, which uh, of course um, I would in a heartbeat do. Uh, he said to me some years ago, uh, uh, Eben, you know, if I, oh no, not years, it was even months, it's light years in, in the development of Justin's career. He said, you know, Eben, I, I would love to come back to you, it's a wonderful place, but if I do that, I'm working for you. Right. Uh, Keith Bergelt's uh, management of the Open Invention Network is the reason that the patent war has not collapsed Western civilization. Uh, also the reason that uh, uh, Sachin Adela is a much more reasonable fellow uh, than his predecessor. Uh, it may be the reason that uh, uh, Horacio gets to build a house in Hawaii pretty soon and retire to it. I certainly hope so. Uh, working with OIN, which I do uh, as much as Keith will let me, is a joy uh, because uh, he is a better strategist, a better intelligence collector, a better negotiator, and is uh, much more acceptable to the really powerful people of the world than I am. Uh, and uh, that has made safety for everybody possible. Our job is keeping people safe who can't pay royalties, and that is hard enough keeping people safe who can pay royalties and keeping them from doing it when they shouldn't do it uh, is an, imp uh, a a an immensely difficult task and Keith has now been performing it uh, in a fashion that I admire the hell out of and you would too if you could see it but it's a secret. Uh, Leonardo Renna uh, has been a patent lawyer uh, in many different contexts, uh, in many different firms, including Brumbaugh Graves, uh, where I had many friends, uh, but not, uh, unfortunately, Mr. Renna, uh, and who is now uh, a senior patent counsel to the most interesting company in the world, Google, with respect to patents. I know it's the most interesting company in the world, but I don't know anything about it because it's a secret. So I look forward to his remarks uh, with particular interest. Um, I hope that the conversation will be lively, both up here and there. And since when I stand in classrooms, I, I always hope that hands will go up. I, I hope they will go up here, too. I'm going to do a, lo a little shepherding so that my clients and other people here aren't asked embarrassing questions. I don't uh, want them to have to be forced to answer. And other than that, I'm just going to let it run. Keith, uh, why don't you begin? Where, where, where are we now and what should we expect? Thanks very much, Evan. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, it's uh, not coincidental that before I took on the, uh, the task of, uh, of taking OIN to, uh, to I think, the, the realization or, of, or the, the reality that it's, it's achieved now and, and really is part of what uh, 10 years ago, IBM and Red Hat and uh, uh, several other companies, Nobel included, uh, really participated in forming OIN in response to litigation that uh, SCO was a wake-up call for, I think, the entire industry and certainly for companies who had the vision to recognize that freedom of choice, freedom to operate could potentially be impaired significantly <clears throat> and the spread and the diffusion of Linux and the the I talk about Linux because really it's the largest project. It's the, I, can, I tend to think about it in, in the open source world as the, 
as the so goes Linux, so goes the community, so goes the movement, the modality. But in the, and for me, the real power is in the modality. It's how we invent and create new value in the economy. The idea of one plus one plus one doesn't equal three, it equals six or 10 or 20, in the way that Ken Arrow envisioned when, when he wrote about increasing returns in the late 50s and early 60s at Stanford. And I think being able to realize and harness this, harness is probably an inappropriate word, but distill this incredible collective intelligence of people across, across organizations but across the globe is truly powerful and that's the thing that really finally attracted me to coming and taking over uh, uh, the leadership and stewardship of OIM. But I was, I would say that by coming to an event here seven years ago, before I actually uh, accepted the, the offer to go to uh, OIN was one of the critical uh, factors. Listening to people, many of the same people that are here today and others who are not, uh, talk about, uh, with passion about open source and talk about freedom and the value of choice, uh, talk about the key legal issues that were, were being wrestled with, some of which we're still wrestling with. Uh, uh, that, that really kind of confirmed for me that this is a community I wanted to be part of. Uh, and I emphasize the term community because uh, my feelings about open source are so tied to uh, these notions of changing the way we invent and create value as in, a, in a part of a global economy. How we break down the, the need for people to come to Silicon Valley or to Route 128. Uh, or, or RTP or elsewhere in the world to contribute value. We need to allow people to invent in situ and, and open source and with the networks and, the, and the, the means of connectivity that we have, is, is, it's a wonderful time and place situation. And, and really, I think even, even though 10 years ago when OIM was being architected uh, at, a, uh, at the Learning Center at, uh, at IBM with 28 lawyers in the room, even though they didn't explicitly uh, understand that this was really uh, a term that, that Evan also mentioned, co-opetition. One of the first articles, the seminal article on co-opetition was written in Harvard Business Review in 1994. Uh, and the notion now seems somewhat obvious, but I think even in 94 it was a little bit of a stretch for many large companies to understand that they could put a toe in the water and then ultimately jump in and they were gonna be okay and they could allow, allow innovation to break out rather than have it exist through controlled mechanisms. Because what we're really looking for is not incremental innovation, which is usually what happens inside large companies. What we're really looking for is the kind of innovation that's <coughs> discontinuous that creates new, 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 new markets or radically re redefines existing ones. So with that as the backdrop, I came into OIN uh, in, a, in an environment where SCO was out there as a marker, always reminding us that, that there were activities that were, on, uh, that were afoot that lived in the world of secrecy, where patent litigation uh, was being planned, where uh, patents were attempted to be sold uh, through a patent laundering scheme by Microsoft, which we intercepted uh, about four years ago. There, there's, a, there's a replete history of activities over the last six years of my tenure at OIN where uh, collusive behaviors were underway to slow or stall the progress of Linux. Uh, and then obviously when, uh, when Android emerged, uh, we had a flashpoint. The, the nice thing about Android is that it, uh, uh, it mirrored what, where iOS came from because both activities were open source projects, op were really derivative of open source projects that one was brought in and closed, one was kept, uh, kept open with some management around it. And so the patent wars, uh, I think, are, to, are petering out in terms of what happens here. Uh, but we are, we are now, through OIN, we have developed a model that we see being, I was just at the Linux Foundation yesterday and they manage a number of open source projects. Uh, and uh, we're in conversations with Karen over the years um, they've been evolving to recognize the success that OIN has had going from 31 licensees in the first two and a half years of its existence to now uh, over 1,200 licensees. We in fact have licensed uh, over 500 uh, new companies in the last 15 months. Uh, 
somewhere in the last 15 months, the last 18 months, a, f a switch has been flipped where people recognize that the, the new cultural norm about appropriate comportment and behavior uh, is one of, of patent non-aggression and freedom and support of freedom of action in key areas. And I mentioned this concept of co-opetition because really what OIN's model is, quite simply, is a determination of where we collaborate and where we compete. Uh, where we collaborate is where we determine that we're going to share patents. We define what is core for multiple projects. We protect that core by, by having companies who participate agree that they will not sue and they will cross-license in that zone of collaboration. And then in the area of competition, they still maintain their rights to utilize their assets as they see fit to be, because in, very, in a very real sense, companies that have patent portfolios and utilize those portfolios live in a world of open and closed. Uh, we're not going to change that because people are inventing <coughs> higher in the stack as a result of, of the, the effect of open source in the last 20 years, 23 years of, of Linux. Uh, we see that inventions occurring much higher in the stack and differentiates is occurring higher in the stack so that we're leaving an area for collaboration uh, which is, whether we're doing it implicitly or explicitly, ex explicitly we've observed this. We've analyzed the, for example, before uh, and, uh, the, uh, the acquisition, the first acquisition of Motorola Mobility by Google, uh, we analyzed their invention strategy for the 10 years of the 90s and the 10 years that followed, and we saw a very explicit movement away from low inve inventing low in the stack to that, that invent invention high in the stack. So I think what's happening and what we see being uh, potentially adopted by other projects uh, that are of, very, of, of great significance is that the cultural norm that, that OIN represents and this, this switch that flipped 18 months ago is putting us in a position where people are buying into the idea readily now, even, even uh, Microsoft uh, is buying into the idea that there are certain areas where we need to, to have a patent non-aggression pact in every project. We agree that in those areas we're going to collaborate and that we're going to compete elsewhere. And I think that fundamental notion is so powerful um, that, and, and so elegant, um, and I attribute it to the, to the, the vision that, uh, that the early framers of OIN had. And one of the things that people, you know, they were always asking me, well, how do you make money? Um, one of the also elements that, that, uh, that IBM, Red Hat, Novell, Sony, NEC, and Philips as the original founders of OIN recognized is that this community won't uh, tolerate an, an, an entity like OIN unless everybody has the same rights, whether they put tens of millions of dollars in or whether they put nothing in. Because to Evan's point, how do we protect the companies that can't afford to defend themselves? Companies like IBM can defend themselves and they've done quite well at that for, for decades. Uh, it's the small to medium-sized enterprise. So of the 1,200 plus licensees that we have, 85 to 90 percent of those companies are always going to be small to medium-sized enterprise because that's the lifeblood of the community. We can never forget where we've come from. And it's forums like this and it's Saturday forums that I've been to in, in Ohio and in Ottawa and in South Carolina and in California and in Seattle. Those are the, 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 the original Linux fests that people come in by bus for you know, take three buses and switch in Des Moines and, you know, show up in Indianapolis on a Saturday morning. That's the core fabric of this community. And those are the people who are, that we're, that we're really fighting this war for. To allow them to, for their creative energies to be in, mixed in with everyone else's creative energies to be able to create that new novelty I talked about. And so, from a patent standpoint, we're seeing this cultural shift, which I think is absolutely critical to companies moving, once, we, as we've created this cultural shift or fostered it, we're putting people in a position where their default choice is about conciliation, not conflict. And that's a critical change in the mentality of, for, especially for large companies that have lived with this defensive posture and this control mechanism, this, this default control mechanism. We're now moving in a much better direction. It's a much healthier community. <coughs> and, and it's really, it's, we're much healthier, not because of just what I've done, but because we've worked collaboratively on the legal side. There is no issue, no significant issue, where I have not been in touch with SFLC and Evan in particular, been in touch with Karen and the Linux Foundation, been in touch with, with individuals who monitor legal issues 
FSF, FSFE, uh, all of the organizations that are involved in helping to foster this, the freedom of choice and freedom of opportunity. And this is exciting for me because this is the vision that I've always had. And from the first, the first seven years ago when I sat in a session and, and, and caught the contagion that, that everyone in this room was sharing at that point uh, um, and had been fostered by SFLC and by FSF and, and by, by the, the image of what RMS was talking about when, for those who had, had had the privilege of being in an audience and listening to him. And so to me, this is a, a form of manifest destiny of, of kind of a vision that I'm carrying forward for the people whose shoulders I stand on. Keith, one of the toughest things that we find ourselves dealing with in community defense is that when a guy goes and pays royalties, he strengthens the attacker in a way that we may not be there in time to intercept. I think it's true that the switch has been flipped on taking OIN licenses. I think the, the resistance that if I take the license, I'm going to be leaking my claims, I'm going to give up my right to sue Linux, I, I don't think anybody really cares about that anymore. Now we have one more switch we have to flip, which is keeping a guy from going and paying a billion dollars a year and strengthening the onslaught from the other side without telling us about it. How do, we make more, how do we make more headway there? How do we get people to be more willing to call the bluff now that we understand just how big the bluff is and how big the numbers are for which they're rolling over? I think the more transparency we have, Mofcom's uh, revelation of the patents that are being used as part of the Android uh, litigation assertion strategy by Microsoft, I think, has allowed for more light to be shown on those patents. Uh, unless... Uh, unless we have not been able to communicate effectively at all to, uh, to Samsung, uh, they should be right now renegotiating their agreements. Uh, for those of you who have not seen it, there's an MCAM study, which is a group out of Charlottesville that's done an analysis of the portfolio. There are other analyses that are underway. Um, the two pillars of, the, of their licensing strategy, which again, some companies have trouble understanding, sorting and sifting through to, under to get to the nub of what they're really paying for, uh, is active synchronization and the XFAT patents. And active synchronization, Microsoft pledged at the time of the interoperability order for the European Commission, they pledged that they would offer those patents at FRAND. In fact, what they did is go back and, uh, and not only not offer them at FRAND, but they charged six times what they had originally charged uh, to one company. And uh, that company uh, obviously was uh, not interested in in paying that and uh, refused to accept that. And as a result, there was litigation, which for the most part was won by, uh, by the company which was being attacked by Microsoft. And so it's having examples of companies, in that case, uh, um, Motorola, where they actually stood up and refused to pay this, this, this excise tax, which if anyone knows, you know, if you know much about this, this business, the, so the mobility business, no one generates real profit. Uh, Apple is the only company that's really profitable because Samsung is a vertically integrated company that, that uh, passes through its, light, its display business of cost, and its display business runs a, runs a deficit every year. So if you really look at the, the, the economics of that business, <coughs> you can't afford to have a billion dollars a year levied on top of you to be able to sustain and to be able to support the kinds of products that, that allow us to work and play more effectively. So it's our diplomacy. We're going to have to get people to be willing to believe that the community can reduce their risks on a role that big. And I think it's also stepping up to, to support them to say it's okay. Because I think you, you, you're dealing, you know, Samsung is a company that is not as seasoned in dealing with some of these issues as some of the companies that are even represented in this room today. And I think we need to, just as we work as a community to share and engage, engage with each other on technology, we need to continue to push the ball to, to ensure that people recognize that they're not operating in isolation. Uh, my, one of the points I make about the community is that with all the opportunities that you have, you have uh, there are obligations that, is, that are associated with it. And part of your obligation, I believe, is to reach out to, to recognize that decisions you make are going to affect how the, re how the rest of the community has to buy in. Early on, I made this point to HTC when they were being sued, and I said, 
we can't let you sign a $12 a $12 a device license. It's not something that you th you may think you have free will over this, but you have to think of the ramifications of what you're doing on everyone else who's going to come after because this is going to be you're, you're laying down a marker that everyone is going to have to now pay $12 to to produce a, an additional $12 to produce a device and that's not tenable. And so that, that was a wake-up call and encouraged them to act, act in a prudent manner. Unfortunately, we couldn't get Samsung to act that way. I, I told you it was a better negotiator than I was, because if I had tried that, it simply wouldn't have worked. Uh, but the first place that SFLC went after Michi built SFLC.in was to Seoul. Uh, and after three years of working hard in Seoul, I feel I have just begun to learn what I would need to know in order to do, as you say, what we need to do next. On the other hand, Leonardo, to, to, to Keith's point about the, the, the ecological nature of this, Google has been remarkably inventive and helpful not in only in dealing with its own patent problems, which would, for a company as big and wealthy as Google, have been easy. It has been innovative and creative with respect to devices that help the community at large to deal with the problems of the patents and sharing. Can, can you help us to understand more the, the Google ideas and strategies around strengthening community defense? Yeah, uh, certainly. So, um, I mean, we, so Google does believe in patent non-assertion and we're a supporter of the open source um, and open source community. Um, to Keith's, I think, earlier uh, point, um, there's, we, you know, we, we see that there's not, we don't think there's a, any one silver bullet to sort of approaching sort of the, the, these issues you know, around patents. Um, we think that there's a lot of complementary approaches that need to be tried. Um, we, we, Google has you know, been very active in fighting its own uh, you know, battles in, in court. Um, and we've been very active in, in uh, the legislative arena and, and also in, in sort of amicus briefs and so forth, um, trying to move the law in, in what we think is, would be a better direction. Um, beyond that, I'd like to maybe highlight a couple of other things that uh, uh, we've been in, uh, enga engaging in um, that are more or less sort of self-help efforts um, within the community. Uh, and so these two programs in, in particular um, that, that we have been uh, involved with and, and, uh, and we think uh, show a lot of promise um, uh, are called LOT, which is uh, short for License on Transfer, and uh, also the uh, Open Patent Non-Assertion Pledge, or OPN for short. Um, I guess it's uh, very close to OIN. <laughs> we, like, we like the, the acronym. Um, so, you know, LOT uh, is not, uh, so, so LOT tries to address the, the issue of, of uh, you know, litigation risk, and, and in particular, litigation risk um, around uh, non-practicing entities. I'm sure everybody in, in the room understands, you know, the, uh, the situation there. Uh, the, you know, litigation from non-practicing entities has been uh, increasing uh, uh, very much year over year, both in terms of, you know, the absolute number of, of litigation as, as well as sort of as a percentage of all patent lawsuits. It, it's been increasing, you know, for, for a decade now. Um, it, it's, it's a real concern, and, and not just for Google. I mean, it, it's a real concern for, you know, for uh, small companies as well. Uh, you know, more than 50% of the targets uh, of uh, these non-practicing MPEs are, are companies that, that make less than $10 million of revenue a year. Uh, so it's really, it's, it's really a big issue, uh, I'm sure, as everybody knows, um, for companies across the spectrum. Um, and Again, you know, legislative efforts have had some limited success, it's, and there's uncertainty about where those are going to go. Um, one of the things that, that we're, pro we're proposing, we just launched it in, in July, is, is this lot program, um, license on transfer. And the, the, the main mechanism that we're proposing is that um, people will join, or, or companies will join this network, and the members will agree to give each other licenses to, the, to their patents but the licenses will not be effective um, until um, a company sells its patent outside of the network. Um, so what it's trying to do, what, what the concept is trying to do is capture um, the situation where um, to, to cut off the source of, of the MPE litigation, 
Um, and and one, one of the statistics that actually I, I, I forgot to, to share, sort of uh, building up the context here, is that you know, we, 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 the operating companies, um, to a large extent, um, are part of the problem here. Um, more than 70% of the patents that, that MPEs um, you know, get to you know, and, and litigate um, come from operating companies. Um, and so in this context, we think it makes sense for like-minded companies, meaning companies that um, uh, agree that you know, patent non-assertion is, is the right approach, uh, to come together and actually commit uh, to, to saying, hey, <coughs> if we sell our patents, um, the members of this network don't need to be worried about them because they will get a license to these patents. Um, now, obviously, there's a lot of details around that, but that is the general, general concept. Uh, membership, so the, the, it launched in July, uh, launched with the founders were, were Google, Canon, um, SAP, and, and Dropbox. Uh, since J July, we've, we're, we're now up to, to 10 members, uh, including Red Hat. Um, and, you know, we, we uh, really, uh, we, we see a lot of interest there. We think it makes sense for, um, for a, a, I think, it would, you know, really resonates also with, with a lot of uh, companies that support open source. Um, it, it's, you know, it's a mechanism um, where, you know, we're working together um, to, to, try to, to try to foster, you know, uh, patent, uh, patent freedom or, or you know, freedom of action and, and patent non-aggression. Um, through, you know, cross-industry, um, you know, cross-industry effort. Uh, so the, uh, I guess some, some other details, you know, maybe some other high-level details, like just to throw out there. I mean, it's open, the, it, it's out there. It's, uh, if anybody is sort of interested in details, uh, the, the website is uh, uh, lotnet.com, so L-O-T-N-E-T.com, and, and it, Anybody can join. The membership is open to, to all all companies. Uh, you know, they're uh, you know beyond the the you know the sort of the general concept that I've, I've given you. There there are obviously a lot of details and happy you know you can find that information on the website. Also happy to you know speak to you um, offline about it as well. Um, and so the you know so that, that's one. That's a lot. Um, in addition to a lot, you know, last year we. Introduced um, the concept of uh, a uh, open patent uh, non-assertion pledge, and uh, this is the the OPN pledge. Um, and what this is is sort of it fills a gap. Again, you know, getting back to this idea that there's not one you know one approach that's going to that's going to be a silver bullet. Um, we think that this fills the gap, and where uh, what it, what it is is that Google has identified a number of patents. Um, have, has specifically identified a number of patents and then has pledged that for those, those patents that we've identified, we will not assert uh, those patents um, with, uh, for, for anyone using uh, open source software. Uh, so, you know, it, in, it, it sort of, it, the gap that this fills is that, uh, you know, we contribute open source software and with that, con you know, with those contributions, you know, we provide um, some patent rights that go with those contributions. We are a member of OIN, which is specific to you know to a certain technology area, and so we we you know we give patent rights to that. This is saying okay, well here are some some patents um, that may may be in technical areas that are not covered either by our contributions or by um, the the patent rights that that uh, that are accompanied you know with the OIN membership. But we are providing sort of freedom of action in relation to, to those areas as well. Uh, so, so those are a couple of uh, areas in addition to some of the other, other efforts that we're making um, that I wanted to sort of uh, highlight and make, make uh, the audience aware of. The, the, the importance of the exclusion of aggression against FOSS has been seen by other parties too. I, I, I don't want to put anybody in sunlight who didn't anticipate it, but I think it's fair to say, for example, about uh, IBM that it has excluded uh, open source contexts from 
patent transfers for some long time. And while it was often difficult for me to hold in my hand a tangible demonstration that an open source exclusion had been applied to a patent transfer, I've always taken Terry's word on it without uh, a, a moment's hesitation. That is to say, uh, uh, individual patent holding companies have done what they could to give us some visibility on the global arms trade and to assist us in our surveillance activities by letting us know that certain munitions were not going to turn up in hands that might be pointed at our clients. Uh, Google's example here, the strength of the publicly doing that is involved in pledging in that way and in gaining purchase for license on transfer is a sort of second order accelerator of this from my point of view. It's important for people to understand that there are two things that go wrong, one of which is companies get hijacked for royalties and the other is that free software developers become afraid that their house, their sleeping bag, their cat might be taken from them in costs of defense against somebody who thinks they can roll them with a lawyer letter. And everything that we do to make non-aggression a norm about which other people also must be conscious is, I think, powerfully on the side of snuffing out the war and bringing peace. In the order of things, I should therefore ask Stefano to talk about how we deal with the problem of the developer who is afraid that he's going to lose his sleeping bag, his cat, and his house. But I actually want to give Justin a chance to talk about something else first. We have, um, we have seen patent law begin to change. Uh, the war has actually had the effect of calling people's attention to this. And it isn't only Belsky and it isn't only CLS Bank. It's a, it's a lot of other associated activity as the lower federal courts and the FedSUR itself begin to understand that there is a Supreme Court in the United States and what it says has influence. H how would you characterize where we are now in the, in the patenting process with respect to the courts and the office? Well, uh, since CLS Bank, there have been, uh, I don't know, on the order of about 20 decisions that have been issued by lower, lower courts, and only, uh, including the federal circuit, and only four have held that um, the patented issue was not invalid. So, in other words, about you know a 20 percent uh, rate of, of validity, you know, moving forward, and the case gets to move forward. So, some of these cases um, held that. You know the court just needs more information to determine whether or not this is a this is a pat this is this patent actually is patentable subject matter or not. And you know a few words about uh, the CLS Bank decision. Um, the the Supreme Court laid down a two-step framework for determining whether or not um, an idea or a, the the patent itself is directed to an abstract idea. The first step is. You know, just ask the question whether or not the idea is abstract. Um, sounds, it seems a little circular. Um, and they don't really tell you what abstract is other than pointing at uh, their precedent. But it, it seems as though um, it's clear that fundamental economic principles um, and uh, methods of organizing human activity are abstract. And these were the uh, cases that were up before the Supreme Court that dealt with, um, you know, for lack of a better term, business method -y type patents, you know, uh, m means of hedging risk, for example. Um, and also the Supreme Court points to uh, mathematical relationships and formulas. So that's kind of the, the backdrop, you know, is the patent directed towards an abstract idea or not? And then the question then is, is has the idea been applied in a way that saves it from just claiming an abstract idea? Is there some part of the invention that, that narrows it sufficiently so that it's not blocking all innovation for this abstract idea. Um, and again, the Supreme Court doesn't clearly delineate what's what, whether or not, you know, what side of the boundary uh, many cases would be on, but they point to their prior precedent. But they, they reference two things which, which should worry us. And the first is that um, improvements to another technology if it's an abstract idea and there's an improvement to another technology, however that's defined, uh, that would save an otherwise abstract idea from uh, being uh, outside of patentable subject matter. And similarly, and I think this is the key one, 
whether or not it's an improvement to the computer itself. So the early returns have been very favorable, and I think that's one of the reasons might be, it's only been a few months, might be because these were kind of easy cases. They all looked like most of these cases were on business methods, for lack of a better term, were on organizations of human behavior, were on means of communicating over a network to contract with people, contract between parties on a network. I mean, these were the types of patents that we saw, but courts, some of the courts were balking even at things like, well, there's a random number generator disclosed or claimed by this process. We don't know whether or not that is an improvement to the computer itself. We need to have expert testimony on that. So it seems like you know, a lot of these cases are kicked out at the very early stages without any discovery, without much less cost, but courts are balking at seemingly, you know, to us maybe, simple concepts like whether or not a pseudo-random number generator is abstract or not. I mean, to me, it seems like it probably would be, unless it's some, somehow novel or, you know, an innovative way of <coughs> doing it that's well beyond uh, what we've seen in the past. So, uh, let's say that easy cases are easy to win first, uh, and harder cases are harder to win later, and new patents will be drafted with new rules in mind. Uh, but all that old foundational stuff out there, uh, which has been used uh, to secure the idea that there is a broad entitlement to royalties uh, everywhere out there in the industry, and I just have to sequence my demands <laughs> correctly, uh, that surely has been burdened a little bit. How, how much uncertainty do you think has been created by all of this with respect to the enforceability of large parts of people's portfolios? I think, I think it's, it's quite large. I mean, it, 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 it was a sweeping decision, and I think that um, people, people realize that. Um, However, you know, m maybe some of the, the stronger patents that disclosed more about how the actual functionality was being done in the specification, those might be saved from abstractness. There, there have been cases where the judge seemed sympathetic to the patent holder. They said, oh yeah, this seems like a novel idea. However, you haven't told me how you do it. <laughs> You've just said the computer does this, but you haven't said, you haven't broken down the algorithm. So th that to me is a, a weaker uh, patent that would be, uh, that's amenable to attack, whereas some of the stronger patents that have more disclosure might be more difficult to invalidate using CLS. So the Industry has experienced a sea change. I think Keith is correct about that. That is, demand for communal defense among businesses is going up rapidly as resistance to the entry barrier of, gee, I'm going to make some commitments not to sue some people who might be my competitors, has dissolved in proportion to the importance of community defense. And there are industry leaders like Google busily trying to create not just devices that will offer some communal protection, but publicizing those devices in ways that an, in an earlier generation might have been regarded as just between us. Uh, <coughs> I don't know what noun to use, girls, chickens, uh, uh, weapons holders, whatever. Uh, and so we are experiencing a, 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 a more uh, uh, public disarmament movement than we have had before where bilateral cross-licensing and some exclusions and other kinds of devices which are transactional in nature were the primary forms of industrial assistance to communal defense. The law has changed a little bit. It's a little marshier under the feet of the trolls and uh, also under the feet of the incumbents who want to slow uh, innovation down. I hope the good news is that old patents are becoming harder to swing because those old patents have been the ones that have caused the most fear. But note that the, the structure is still one in which the primary concern is how to protect the people who make money and are subject to being bitten for royalties. This is surely, outside SFLC's particular corner of practice, uh, the most important question. It's where the big money is. 
Uh, where we work, on the other hand, the primary problem is how to protect the weak and the really weak sense of weak. That is to say, how to protect parties who do not have revenue to pay lawyers, uh, who, if threatened, may feel they are compelled to roll over because there is no way that they can pay for defense, and who are being bitten not for royalties but for the removal of features or the effort to avoid running into somebody's patent, which is simply there to prevent the commoditization of some thing or other that we also know how to do. The Debian community ships more than 33,000 packages, Stefano, and therefore its footprint of vulnerability to that kind of activity is pretty high. Um, how does Debian think about patent threat and what does it do about it? Yeah, so what I want to offer to you is my experience based on when I was Debian project leader in Debian for three years on w the different perspective that we might have in comparison with the perspective of corporations and of companies. So, as I've been said, we're a pretty big project. I think we have, we have passed the threshold of one billion lines of code. So if someone wants to sue a project selling, uh, distributing one billion lines of code, you will find an excuse to do that. And no matter how bogus it's that, but you will find an excuse to do that. Uh, also, the Debian case is particular because not only we're a community mainly mo made by mostly by volunteers, we're about 1,000 developers, but we are also a community whose products are used by companies to actually create businesses which are already in the multi-billion kind of businesses. So there are people making a lot of money using Debian as a rock, and that, that's great. I mean, that's one of the purposes of free software, okay? So, but our risks are completely different from the risks that we have seen here. For instance, the typical risk of patent trolls is not something we usually fear. So we do have money, but we do not have important money that will make us interesting for patent trolls. So someone has mentioned that the typical target of patent trolls are company are, they are below 10 million budget per year. Well, ours is much lower than that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's not like someone is likely to sue us for that reason. It's not likely that someone is going to sue Debian for just seeking money in general, if they, even if they are not properly a non-practicing entity. But of course, someone might want to sue Debian for some value of suing Debian that I'll get to, uh, for anti-competitive warfare. So maybe there is a feature in Debian they do not want it to be there. Or maybe they want to bother some of those businesses which are making money on top of Debian. Maybe they do not want to bother Debian as a project, but they want to bother someone else who is using Debian to make some easier for them. So, or maybe they want to put in trouble people that are using the same non-profit organizations we are using to do day-to-day -day financial business. Um, so we, we fear about that, and we fear about individual developers. Maybe they just want to uh, make a specific developer in trouble for other stuff he's doing in other projects, and suing that person for the kind of stuff software he's working in in Debian is a possible potential way to go, out, to go around that. And if we do so, if they do so, we do not have the usual protection that company has. Company ad, okay. For instance, we do not have the usual protection that you have when you have a relationship between employer and employees because we are just volunteers. Essentially, from the point of view of law, for most point of view, Debian do, does not exist as a entity. Okay, we're just volunteers working together and doing stuff together. So this is one of our main concerns. The other concerns we have is on one hand the spread of uh, FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt that we have on patents. Because when you are working in a company, you have the law department of the company who's going to explain to developers what's, <coughs> what they do need to fear, what they do not need to fear. Well, in a community, we are just victim for all the kind of advertisement that we see in the patent world. So we will have a lot of discussions about whether we should in include something or not in our distribution, which are, of course, are discussions that are going to happen in public, and those make them very dangerous discussion. Okay, and more worried. More, more worrisome for me is the fact that developers, individual developers, tend to think that the patent world is actually easily splittable in two sets of patents. Patents w which are enforced and patents which are not enforced. So we just need to stay away, uh, to stay away from you know, the patents that are being enforced and everything else is just fine. That's not the case because we, you might have patent in the other, you know, in the other part and may, they might be much more dangerous and much more real than the, more, than the most famous patent, but we just do not know about that. And essentially, if you accept that kind of split, you're giving a big hammer to just the 
the people that shout the most about their own patents. And that's not really acceptable from a free software point of view. And finally, the third kind of worry we have is some sort of moral responsibility toward our downstream. So we do not make any promise on patent. We do not promise that uh, the archive is just non-patent encumbered. We promise that everything is free software and that we will look into patents if we are aware of issues. But still, even if we make no promise, we do care about our downstreams and we try not to make them in trouble. So these are the kind of worries we have, which are not related to having to pay your royalties or having to enter into a one billion per year uh, agreement with, uh, with Microsoft. That's not what we fear. And so what can we do about that? So we, we I made a short list of what helps, what would help in our case and what doesn't help and what would be really great to have. So in terms of what doesn't help us is anti-troll legislation. So I'm not really much up to date about the uh, discussion in the US about anti-troll legis legislation, but as an European, the kind of glimpses I get of that debate is that most of the measures that are being discussed are anti-troll measures. And I think those are great for, for big, co big companies, but honestly, it wouldn't change much for us, given, the, given that we are not target for trolls anyhow. So stuff that helps are case law that limits the scope of patents that definitely help, like Bilski, like Alice, you've mentioned. But they help only partially because we are so big in scope that we, we are certainly find, uh, people can certainly find other reasons to sue for software that is in Debian. Essentially, no scope uh, reduction that is short of abolishing completely patent would really help in our case. What helps a little bit as well is um, defensive patent pools like OIN. We are really happy that essentially companies are uh, finding ways to not suing each other about stuff that can be in Debian as well. That, that's something that helps. But in some sense, initiatives like OIN are still too small for us. They are too small in one way because the definition, the Linux system definition of OIN is a strict subset of stuff like Debian, okay? That could be fixed and we have been working with uh, with OIN to try to improve on that, but as long as that's not covering uh, yet the whole of the Debian archive, that's still too little for us. And also, it's too small in the sense that we have no guarantee that you know, the uh, people that might want to sue Debian are actually OIN licensee. So there might always be someone which is not an OIN licensee that can have an anti-competitive reason for suing someone that is related to Debian. Uh, so, Stuff that really helps is in some sort of different category. So what really helped for us is having educational material for developers explaining what are the patent risks, what should they fear, what sh they should not fear, what they should do when something bad happens, if something bad happens. And I'm really happy that we've been able to work with SFLC in producing some of those material, but we really need much, much more. And also what helps are two, um, two subjects that we, have, that we have discussed today. So one are non-profit organizations that act as uh, umbrella organization for projects like Debian, like SPI, like Software Freedom Conservancy, and uh, the others we have mentioned today, because we need those entities. We need them to be aware of patent risk, not to, you know, to be too scared if someone uh, show up knocking at their door with an alleged patent violation. And uh, we also need access to pro bono law counseling. So low, low legal advice. So the work that SFLC is doing for us has been tremendously important. We need those kind of entities to exist. And I want to point out that it's not only a matter of money, because I'm pretty sure that if things go badly with Debian and someone starts suing a Debian developer for a patent, uh, some kind of patent litigation, Debian will not have a lot of trouble raising money to stand up in court. But the problem is, having some sort of legal advice that we know it's aligned from an ethical point of view with the views of Debian on free software, someone that we can trust on an ethical level, okay? And that's really, really important. So for a smaller project, I'm pretty sure the, the economic um, argument would be really important, but for a project like Debian, ethical alignment is as important as that. So in short, w the only thing that would really help for us would be uh, stopping completing the patent game. So um, if I can paraphrase, like uh, World Games, the, the, the only winning move for us is not even not to play, is actually to abolish completely the game. <laughs> Thanks. Which, um, on a global level around the world in the next 20 years, I don't think is going to happen, much as we will continue to try in our client's interest to urge complete disarmament, it seems unlikely. I, I, I think the thing which is most important here to emphasize 
uh, is that uh, the processes that we go through may resemble in our practice substantially the kinds of processes that businesses also go through. We conduct patent surveillance, but we are very poor. Uh, we conduct efforts uh, to understand uh, possible exposures to the great big world of third party patent claims that we don't know anything about. And in this we rely very heavily uh, on companies with whom we work which may share with us some portion uh, of their knowledge, but they will do so of course only in their own interest and with great care. Uh, and we attempt to provide uh, some deterrent uh, against the easy uh, invocation of other people's patent rights against our projects and our clients. Uh, here, we're inhibited in telling war stories pretty much in the same way that everybody else in the patent world is inhibited by telling war stories. But I will say that once or twice a year now, somebody comes along and says, you should take that feature out. Uh, we think you're infringing our patent this or that. and. Uh, uh, we find ourselves uh, with a battle of claim charts in a way that any patent lawyer in the room will find perfectly ordinary. Except that we're doing it, as Stefano has suggested, primarily to defend a human being, uh, which is never the experience of the patent lawyers elsewhere in the room, uh, for whom personal liability is a non-issue. The patent system is thought of, generally speaking, as some kind of battleship game where the only thing that you fire at is large boats on the other side. Uh, but as Stefano has emphasized, for us it is never like that. Uh, for clients like Debian uh, or the Apache Software Foundation, um, what we are talking about is personal patent liability, uh, uh, a subject for which there aren't any books and there aren't any navigation charts. Uh, and uh, in the process of building systems that keep individual developers safe, uh, we are highly dependent upon interactions with a secretive and centralized system for protecting businesses, which we are not in any position to change uh, and which we must work with on very obscure terms. Uh, Ethical alignment may be, as Stefano says, crucial to our clients. Uh, ethical alignment is not important to the working that we do with businesses with whose cooperation, without whose cooperation we could not help our clients. This has been the most complicated and difficult part of our practice in this area over the last 10 years and it will continue to be. Uh, and when we win a fight like that, we win it in the dark just as you do uh, and we are just as unable to trumpet it as you would be. Uh, and we find ourselves, therefore, back at square one every single time. Uh, I'm grateful to Stefano, of course, for saying that they need us. Uh, we need you. It's not only your support in monetary terms that allows us to provide the representation that the project needs. Uh, it is primarily the invention of strong community defense structures in which communities can bring their somewhat different needs uh, and be received warmly and in fellowship even though we aren't paying for a seat and don't have money and don't even have our own patent portfolios to throw in the ring. The openness of community defense is the reason that it works for our clients. The minute that community defense becomes business community defense, uh, it ceases to work for us altogether for the reasons that Stefano has offered. Questions? That's what patents feels like. Yes, Karen. <laughs> You want to take any responsibility for this? You're going to leave me uh, to defend my crazy idea by myself. Yeah, uh, go for it. Yeah, you know, that's, that's that's what it's like when one of your guys uh, look. I mean, the, the one the one molecule per patent structure of pharma never came to depend upon the weirdnesses like I have a transaction and the internet. 
uh, which, which, which came to be the way in which a lot of software-affiliated IT patenting went on. And as we sort of slice our way towards another system of patent scope with respect to IT patenting, which may turn out to be at its minimum, as Justin has suggested, sort of don't try and claim business as usual plus the internet, or which might turn out to be a deeper and more complete uh, agreement about things that are outside patent scopes, signal transformation, math and algorithms, abstract structures for the conduct of things without a thermometer to measure rubber temperature or whatever, what we are effectively doing is taking the areas in which we are actively trying to change patent law and moving them away from the comparatively simple, straightforward, and clear forms of patenting that pharma has depended on. That's one. The second thing is that the global structure of the pharmaceutical industry isn't the same as the global structure of IT. Pharma has a different set of problems to deal with around the world right now. Um, what happens in India with respect to patenting around IT and smartphones will be a very political subject. What happens in India with respect to pharma patenting has already been a very political subject for a very long time, and pharma must cope with it on that basis. Pharma's relationship to the Chinese patent system can be summed up in a word, corruption. Uh, as Chinese government seeks to try to get corruption under control, comma, to the extent it does, comma, if it means it, period, they will find themselves, as they are now over travel agencies in Shanghai, in a very serious collision with Western Pharma, which has been bribing its way around the, the problems in the system for a very long time. All of that is fundamentally different than the dynamics which we are engaged with, sometimes better, sometimes worse. But to the extent that we got into the problem that we did, because there were only two industries in the world that really cared and they were joined at the hip, they're not joined at the hip anymore. And for those of us who think that the game should be modified in such a way that someday it could be wound down altogether and completely, that's positive. It's not short-term valuable yet, but it is long-term very important to us, I believe. Anybody want to comment further? You want to, you, you, no, okay, no, I'm still wrong. That's no, great. No, I don't. Um, yes, Rob. You know, we, as I mentioned, we Google was involved in, in uh, efforts to uh, to further some of the legislative proposals um, uh, and reform efforts uh, on the Hill. Uh, I think I'm not giving anything away by saying, if, you know, they're not going anywhere this year. Um, <laughs> and uh, it seems unlikely in the short term that, or there's there's a lot of uncertainty whether there's going to be any success in that in, in the short term. Um, and you know. It's obviously very political, and depending on how you know the, the elections go and so forth, um, it, it, there's a lot of factors that that will uh, play into you know whether there's you know, success in, in that arena. Just, I just want to say, it, from a from a recent legislative perspective, I think that the um, post grant review proceedings have become a, a very useful sword for for companies to combat uh, patent trolls. And so uh, that itself was, I think, a win uh, in, in that space. And at the same time, I think that the recent Supreme Court decisions, which have been cutting down on patents, CLS Bank is the only one that have been a lot, many more Nautilus for one regarding indefiniteness, um, <coughs> that have really provided uh, defense attorneys with you know more arrows in their quiver for lack of a better term. Um, so I think that once that shakes out, you know, maybe that can be reevaluated by people, but I think that it might be wise to let the post-grant reviews go forward, let the you know, recent uh, case law go forward, and then, then see what happens after that. Yeah, I, to follow on to Justin's comment, I think American Vents Act version one 
which we're working under now, has had uh, the benefit of, of advancing IPRs, these post-grant reviews, so that we've seen real success, real traction there in invalidating poor quality patents or at least dramatically reducing claim scope. In addition, the pre-issue and submission process, which we've taken a, a, a pretty significant position on, we've had good success in, uh, in being able to get rejections or to reduce claim scope on newly issued application, newly, newly issued patents that are in application still, and so, or that are just about to go to, uh, to approval. And so I think those are things, I think to your, to your question, it's, it's always going to be about meeting whatever happens that you, with judicial and, uh, and regulatory reform, uh, legislative reform halfway. I think programs, what OIN represents, what, what Jason I don't think is here anymore, but what they're trying to do with the, the, the general patent license, uh, what, what Google's doing, all of these programs are ways <coughs> of dealing and meeting, meeting as community-led programs, meeting what's happening with the judiciary and, and legislative reform halfway. So I think that's necessary. And I think really to, to the point about how do we help ourselves, one program that we, we've taken a page out of, out of IBM's book, which most people think IBM's, you know, produces all these patents and it's very inventive, and that's true, but they don't really only know the part of it if they don't look at the defensive publications that are produced every year, because that shows the full scope of inventiveness of this company. And if you look at what, what those are, those are efficient ways of creating statements of prior art that, get, that prevent other people from getting patents on ideas. If we could mobilize the community and create this generative capacity to codify what we know, what we invent on a regular basis in a healthy way, a healthy form of invention that is a statement of prior art that prevents other people from getting patents, we're dealing with the future issues. Rather than just fix what's broken now and then have these process, have these issues be, be still remain for the future, let's deal also with the future by taking the inventive, incredible inventiveness of this community, utilize a vehicle that's existed for decades to be able to codify and mark our territory so that fewer patents can get issued. That, that deals with the, the it, 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 for those who are supportive of patents, they're still supportive of the notion of higher quality. We've got to get higher quality patents if we, for those of us who accept patents, we need higher quality patents. I think everybody can agree that if patents are going to be sustained as a, as a form in, in the software world, let's at least make the bar so high that the only things that get through are things that are so specific, so, so precise, that it's very unlikely anybody's really going to run afoul of this. I, I'm going to close down only in the interest of time, unless there are others who have pressing questions. But I will say, Rob, that the thing that most concerns me, as I suggested this morning, is that legislation happens in one country. And the truth of the matter is that it is now happening if it is the United States Congress you are talking about, a body I haven't seen in years and don't expect to begin seeing in January either. But even if the United States Congress turned up suddenly and began responsibly doing what it is supposed to do, namely legislating for the public benefit, it would be in the wrong country. What we actually have now is a global problem. The fire spread while we were not able to stamp it out here, and we are now going to face it in a different way, in a different place, where legislation will not reach it. This is why the problem of how do we help ourselves seems to me to be so crucially important. Defensive publication will work well in any system in which novelty is assessed under the rule of law. It will work poorly anywhere in which novelty is assessed according to a call from the guy in the party. Uh, which means that what we ultimately are going to have to assume is that any increasing integrity in the U.S. patent system will be essentially an exportation of the problem to somewhere where it is harder to get to. The equilibration mechanisms that we are going to require are going to have to operate independent of legislative integrity, comma, if there is any, period. This is the real challenge I think we're going to have to face. And although I would love to believe that what we're going to discover is better relations with the USPTO and more pre-grant intervention and more post-grant review and more open discussion and more defensive publication are also going to spread around the world the way the US patent system spread around the world, I'm by no means convinced. 
This is a conversation that will never end, but I am deeply grateful to everybody for participating in it and to my client for making it so easy to represent. Thank you all very much. <laughs>